Morning, Dirk. Hi, Kathy. How are you? I'm good. Oh, you, you're not all bundled down today. Well, I am a little. <laughs> it just doesn't show as much. You have the lap blanket going on. Yep, I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> and I got three shirts on. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Yeah, my son in Iowa, he's in Ida Grove. He says it's getting cold. Well, we're just trying. To, we're keeping the house. Uh, we're keeping the heater down. That's all. What temperature? Otherwise, you, you on. <laughs> what temperature do you keep it at? Keeping it at fifty-eight for now. Oh wow! So yeah, because uh, well, heating oil has gone way up, and yeah, uh, we're. Oh, I just realized I don't have my headset on. <laughs> and the so, cats, the cats are okay with that. Oh, cat, cats, cats are the toughest animals on the planet. Oh, okay. And plus they have all kinds of ways of getting around it if they want to. Yeah. One of which is getting under the covers with us at night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they go under the covers. They, they yeah, they're, they're. <laughs> <laughs> they just do what they do. Yeah. They're <laughs> so when do you come out? Uh, the 30th. Oh, Okay. That'll be I, good to see you. By the way, I really enjoyed your talk. I didn't have a, much of a chance to tell you. But well, thank you. A few weeks ago, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's nerve wracking, as you know, but um, I think it's important that we do it. You know. And we we'll couldn't see. be with a kinder audience. I mean, it's not like we're thrown out there into the wolves, you know. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes they throw tomatoes at me. Fortunately, I'm too far away. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Marie. <laughs> yeah. Well, Are you running a, the show today? No, I don't know why I'm. <laughs> I'm not running anything. I'm just waiting right. to. <laughs> things for to start i know they're doing a lot of testing i know wednesday night meditation we i stayed on afterwards because they're doing just so much to get this whole hybrid system working yeah properly so that's kind of tough yeah it is it's where i think we're finding it a lot tougher than we thought it was going to be but gives me great respect for people that run TV and things like that because oh yeah it takes a lot of technical knowledge sorry I was just looking to make sure I had something to act as a backup if need be <laughs> yeah nothing seems to be going on yet so or no we're not privileged to it anyway. We'll just see. I was hoping Serge would be talking today. Hi, Nick. How, How are you, Mary? Serge? Who are you hoping was going to be talking today, Dirk? Serge. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Hey, Serge. How are you? Quite well. What about you? Good. Doing good. Enjoying cooler weather. <laughs> What's it like? What is it? Seventy five? It's in. It's seventy one today. So oh. yeah, it's in. The, it's still in the seventies. It's like here, yeah, like in Santa Rosa. But nice. sunny and breezy, and yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, I was actually just looking up to see if Valley of Fire is open on um, Thanksgiving because <laughs> that's what I'm doing. I'm hiking. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a good thing to be doing. You look great. You feeling Thank good? You. I um, I am finally Are you coming? In. Oops. And uh, enjoying the Mojave. Yeah. Good. Here we go. From Minneapolis, or where are you going? I forget. On the day. Here we are. I'm very suspicious. We're mirror image. Yes, exactly. I can flip it around. So, Connor, <laughs> the mics don't seem to be I can't working. Laugh. Uh, Seems like that. Yeah, we're using the new one. So we have we have these receivers on and whatnot. Uh, sound is up over here to those mics. Um, they should be on. It seems to Things be are on. Phantom power is on. Yes, you don't have now it's all the only this many. Yeah. Do we look good? Okay, let's take it out. Look like you just took over a bank. You got the masks on. Checking, checking, okay. checking, okay. checking. Yeah. Ellen, can you? Yes, test. test. Okay. Good, we're good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear us from the audience panel? Yes. So, uh, so are we are we at the live now? I don't know. Are we live now? Great. Okay. So uh, we'll start with the seven line prayer. Oh, the door is closed to the bathroom. 
I was like, oh, Buddha that's, that's gone. gone. Fully and perfectly, perfectly awakened Buddha. Buddha. Oh, God with knowledge and good conduct. Gone to bliss, nor of the world. Helmsman of ordinary, ordinary beings to be tamed. Supreme one, teacher, teacher of all gods and men. Buddha, Buddha Poe destroyer, glorious, victorious one. Chakamuni, do you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge? Teacher, Poe destroyer, thus gone. Fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Poe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, Poe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, Gone to bliss, nor of the world. Most men of ordinary beings to be tamed. Supreme one, teacher of all gods and men. Buddha, Bo destroyer, glorious, victorious one. Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of men, were born, he took seven steps on this great earth, and he said, I am supreme in this world. To you who rise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body. Supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, Feel devotion like merits and good qualities to the best God and I prostrate. The purity, free from attachment, to the virtue, releases from the evil and realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field, endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge. Homage, homage to the great Sangha, to all, all three ever devout homage, to all, all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous action, but accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, mirage, or lamp, illusion, drops of dew, bubbles, trains, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, disturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in Tama and Enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time. And rejoice, rejoice in the in virtuous the actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. To the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make with a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings of wealth and the, the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. 
Jiram Guru The heart of the perfection is the mantra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajabriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration of the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of a lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of a lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom to look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly. Those five aggregates also is empty in your nature. Form is empty. empty. Emptiness, emptiness is form. Emptiness, emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. emptiness. In the, the same, same way, feeling, feeling discrimination, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Chaiputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristics, unproduced, unseat, stainless, not, not without stain, stain not, not deficient, not fulfilled. Chaiputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling. No, no discrimination, discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element and so on, and up to and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no distinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is, there is no, no suffering, suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shaiputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, the bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All, All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken into unsurpassable perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Taita, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhisattva. We'll do 20 more to ourselves. Shai Putra, the Bodhisattva and Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commanded the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, well said son of lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have been indicated, even the Tathagata has rejoiced. Bhagavan having, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharvata Putra, the Bodhisattva, the Mahasattva, Arya Avokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you, Patty. 
So welcome everyone. My name is Ellen Wolf. I'm a student of Lama Yeshe Tipta's. I think I know most of you, although maybe not all of you. Um, we're going to do a panel this morning, and the motivation for this panel came from the fact that probably almost all of you, if not all of you, know that John Rinpoche is going to come in a few weeks and do uh, Jainan Empowerment of Kala Chakra. And Kala Chakra is um, one of my favorite practices. And it, it didn't necessarily start out that way. I took um, an empowerment on Kala Chakra in 2009 from the Dalai Lama. And then soon after the Jainan from John Rinpoche, who had come here to do a retreat to the Lions Road Dharma Center. Um, and I was pretty overwhelmed and awestruck by it all. And I had no idea what I was doing. And I have to say, it's been through the practice with the Sangha here that's really um, allowed me to grow my love for Kala Chakra and appreciate its richness and have a, a relationship to it of some sort. So the idea today, we have a, a very esteemed um, set of panelists compiled. <laughs> um, and the, the point is to talk about um, how they see the Kala Chakra practice and their experience both with um, having done the initiation, what it was like for them, but also then how the practice has impacted their experience with Kala Chakra. So um, I think it'll be fantastic. There are two of the panelists here and then there are two online. So, um, and I've, what, what we're gonna do is I've asked them to introduce themselves. So they'll be doing that. But then also to ask, to answer some questions for you to talk a little bit about how they got, in, got involved with Kala Chakra to begin with, because all of us have had already some empowerment in Kala Chakra. Um, you know, what made them choose to, to take the initiation and to practice Kala Chakra? Um, and then how has it been? You know, how's it, how's the practice of Kala Chakra had their experience with Kala Chakra evolve over time? What's that been like? And then we're also lucky to have on our panel two people that relatively recently took the Kala Chakra initiation from Kensa Rinpoche. And so they're sort of newbies in a sense. I mean, of course, we're all newbies, right? But, but um, people that maybe for others that haven't had the initiation or done the practice yet have more direct experience with what it's like to be fresh in it. And so they're going to also add their experience about what it's like to, to jump into this world. And all of us it's really a fantastic practice group here at Lions Roar. We've all practiced, of course, many of you I've practiced with as well over the years. This group in particular practices really regularly. So um, I think it'll be a nice experience. And then we'll take some questions. We have questions submitted ahead of time. And then you can chat in questions or just get some questions after everybody's had a chance to talk for a few minutes about their experience. Then we'll open it up and we'll have a little q &A. Uh, so you'll be able to direct your question to one of the panelists or just offer it generally and we'll, we'll field it. So with that, I'm going to start with Doug. And Doug, if you'd introduce yourself and talk a bit about your Kala Chakra experience. How's that? So my name is Doug Kleinsmith, and I met Lama Jumpa in 2011. And a few months later, I heard they're offering the Janan initiation Kala Chakra. I had no idea what it was, but they were advertising it. And I happened to have Darshan with Lama. I asked him, should I take it? And he said, sure. So I said, sure, why not? I wanted to take as many practices as possible. It sounded very interesting. And uh, that was the only actually uh, yoga practice that I'd ever even heard of and done. So and my motivation was really, I, I really thought I should take as many practices as possible that I was allowed to take. And it was very convenient to have him here in Sacramento. And uh, at the time, I wasn't aware of any commitments. So, <laughs> so it was it sounded pretty good to me. Uh, I think soon after that, we started having 
monthly Kala Chakra sessions with Lama in someone's house, which looked like a temple. It was a very nice uh, experience where he went over the meaning of these practices and, and we got to do the full practice uh, once a month on Sunday. And I still wasn't doing any practice of Kala Chakra by myself. And then someone asked, is there a shorter practice? And he said, yeah, there's the six session guru yoga, which someone emailed to everyone. And that was great because that was a short one that I could do a certain amount of times every day. I did it three times a day. And it was a summary, real summary of uh, a basic guru yoga practice. And so I've actually been doing that for the last uh, nine years. So it's pretty simple. Uh, since I didn't have that much of a commitment, it was easy to adjust to that. Uh, uh, the real benefits that I noticed from Kala Chakra was when we started doing it as a group on a regular basis about a year ago. Uh, every week on Wednesdays, we would meet and we still meet on Wednesdays. And one thing I noticed is that it relates to Kala Chakra being called Wheel of Time, that my timing improved. There was a lot of what some people call synchronicity in life. And the, the most noticeable things are the small things. Like, oh, I think I'll walk into the kitchen and then the timer goes off. The food's ready. The larger things, you'd have to wait, you know, a, a long time to see how your life has intersected with other people's lives and how you maybe even spontaneously helped out when you didn't even realize you were doing so. And it supports my practice because all of these additional practices besides regular meditation uh, help take you beyond your ego to your real nature. And this certainly does that too, especially, you know, right after the practices or any other duty of practice, it's the best time to do something. Uh, you just feel more energized and, uh, you want to do something, you don't want to just not do anything. And I think that's about all I have to say. Uh, well, next we're going to go to Marie. So maybe we could just turn off for now. Thanks, Doug. Uh, we're going to, so we're going to go to Zoom land now and take a, a Zoom panelist. Marie, she's going to. Hello, everyone. Hopefully, my internet will hold up for this. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. I'm Marie Gillis. And um, I am joining you from uh, Clark County, Nevada, in southern Nevada. And um, I'm one of Lama Jimpa's students. I met Lama in uh, 2008. And uh, after checking him out for a couple of years, started coming to Lion's Roar um, in around 2010 and then uh, took refuge in 2011 with Lama. So it's actually, uh, October was my 10 year refuge anniversary. So that's really wonderful. And uh, in 2011, I also, uh, along with the rest of uh, many of the Lions for students, uh, attended the Kala Chakra Jaina with uh, Jada Rinpoche, uh, which was an amazing uh, event at Gadatsu Church. Um, and that was a really transformative moment for me. I, I honestly uh, really didn't know what to expect and what I was walking into when I went to the Jainan. And uh, I have to say, it was like being hit by lightning. Uh, I was truly transfixed and realized that this was what I wanted to make into kind of the center of my life. So um, for me, attending that college chakra Jainan was really, uh, honestly, I think it's probably the most important day of my life. You know, maybe other than being born, that's a big one. Um, and then I also took the uh, empowerment from Kentro Rinpoche in 2016 in Richmond um, at Gyuda. So uh, that was also a really wonderful event. And I feel uh, very fortunate to have been able to go to both of them. 
uh, and I'll continue to go to as many, you know, Jnans and impairments for Kala Chakra as I can. Um, and I, I think that I was really, uh, in many ways, uh, especially initially attracted to Kala Chakra because for many years I was involved in uh, peace work, um, in anti-nuclear work and in social justice causes. Uh, the Dalai Lama really calls his campaign of, of these you know, global empowerments Kala Chakra for world peace. And uh, I think that's something we can use an awful lot more of. So that was really, to me, uh, so meaningful because there's so few people talking on that scale any longer, right? And that's really the scale we need to be thinking of. So, um, so that's really kind of my, my background of why I got involved in the whens and stuff. Um, and I really think that for me, my color chakra practice, uh, has very much been a journey. Um, there have been times when I have done, you know, that succession guru yoga on a daily basis. There have been times when I've done it on a weekly basis. Uh, there have been times where I've done it alone. And I'm so fortunate to actually be involved with uh, a wonderful Lions Roar group. That's been one of my favorite things for my, my dream for years was that we would have regular group Kala Chakra practice. And so uh, one of the benefits of the pandemic has been that we finally uh, were able to put that together. And I appreciate so much the dedicated practitioners who keep showing up in, you know, in friendship and that kind of common goal uh, for everyone. So. It's, it's a really beautiful thing. Um, and, and Kala Chakra really is, it's, I, I think doing any Tantra uh, is like a journey, but for me, I very much uh, kind of can perceive the last 10 years very much in, in that context where, you know, there are times when the summit of the mountain seems so clear for a moment, right? And then there are times when it's kind of obscured by clouds and there are times where the ground underneath you feels really steady and solid. And there are times when it feels like you're slipping backward in gravel. And there are times when the path seems very straight and clear. And there are times when you might run into a dead end. And all of that is exactly the way it's supposed to be because it's exactly like the journey that we're all taking uh, in our lives. It is the journey to Shambhala, right? That, that place where we all come together uh, in the center. So that's really kind of how I perceive my, my Kala Chakra training and practice. And I also really try and bring that really into my everyday life. So I really started trying to perceive like every day like that. And, like uh, coming to, uh, I'll be traveling to Sacramento, right? So I'm gonna try and see my journey back to Sacramento and then back home to Nevada as like a microcosm of that same journey because they really are. And even one step can be that same journey. So, um, and I really loved what Doug said about time because uh, Kala Chakra has changed my relationship with time as well. And I think that's why in some way um, the journey has become so important because I don't feel anymore like it all has to happen like right now. You know, there's, there's, there's a time and a context and a framework. And that's the other thing that I love about Kala Chakra is it, I'm not a great intellectual, I'm not a great Buddhist scholar. And uh, I'm a meditator and uh, I love meditation and I love the training. And so for me, Kala Chakra gives me kind of a, a visionary and experiential framework for more intellectual concepts of like emptiness and ultimate bliss and their union, those Mahamudra ideas. So really for me, that's been the beauty and uh, what I've kind of come to 
right now understand about Kala Chakra and, and what it's been for me. So thank you all. Thank you, Marie. Marie's been one of the steadfast uh, people to bring us together in practice. So I appreciate it very much. Um, Patty, can we borrow the mic again? Because Elizabeth doesn't have. I'm a new practitioner. I took my empowerment this summer um, from uh, Pinto Rivers A in Australia. And I got involved because I had already been practicing a short Kala Chakra guru yoga. And I asked Lana if it was all right to take the empowerment. The empowerment was really long. <laughs> goes on forever. And there were many technical difficulties. Um, but uh, the Lama, the Rinpoche giving it, I had a very detailed book, which was extremely helpful. And uh, Lama asked me to read this book, which is a Burzen book, uh, Introduction to the Kala Chakra Initiation. And it's an excellent book to kind of get you up to speed about what you're going to see in a, one of the long, uh, long empowerments. And so when I got done, I was a little <laughs> uh, famished. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. And I knew Ellen and I knew it, we had a group. So I started attending there. And then um, um, Jam Yang leads also was a group uh, early in the morning for the West Coast. And so I started attending that group. And um, there was a lot of education there and a lot of dedicated folks. So it started to get easier and easier. And the Kala Chakra visualizations I like uh, I like them, and so I spend a lot of time visually um, inhabiting uh, the mandala and the deities, and um, that is a tremendous experience. It really enhances my practice. So I've spent a lot of time looking and reading about the different parts of the mandala and enhancing and naming them so I know where they are and I know where I'm at in the practice. And um, I find it a full physical body activity with the mudras and the different, um, <laughs> different cycles of the um, practice that you go through. And I find that very, um, pleasurable and interesting. And I do the short practice every day. And I try to add a different aspect, particularly on visual. So a different aspect of the visual every day. So there are different deities and naming and filling in their colors and who they are and what they might be holding. It's, it's exciting and challenging. So before this, my main practice was shamatha and abhidharma. Thank you, Elizabeth. And so we have one more. We'll go back to Zoom land, Dirk. So Dirk, please uh, share your experiences with us as well. Hi, uh, well, I'm Dirk. Um, I took refuge with Lama Jinpa in 2017. Uh, I came to Kala Chakra, Ch Kala Chakra kind of a little bit reluctantly, actually. Um, I have uh, several highest yoga tantric empowerments and uh, a lot of commitments along those lines, and particularly. Uh, Shitro and, and uh, Vajrakalaya, 
and others. Uh, so I didn't really want to add more to what I already have uh, bestowed upon me. And Ellen was kind of uh, much of a force in bringing me around to following this. Uh, plus, uh, you know, I come from more of a Nyingma background. Uh, and so those other practices are Nyingma, but I didn't really have a Sangha to practice any of that stuff with. So not regularly in any case and nobody nearby. So it was attract very attractive to me to uh, have a group that was committed to practicing together on a regular basis so that I could practice, not have to practice in isolation. Uh, and although Lama is very supportive of my uh, other practices that are not in the lineage of the Galigpa, well, the, the, the empowerment that I took at the same time that uh, Elizabeth took the empowerment from Kentro Rinpoche on mine, that's actually a different lineage of Kala Chakra, uh, but they uh, aren't mutually exclusive. They just have slightly different details and various things. So anyway, uh, I'm sort of the least of the practitioners that's talking on this panel, but I would like to a little bit address the idea of uh, what we're actually talking about being done at the temple with Jado Rinpoche. We aren't taking an empowerment with Jado Rinpoche, we're taking a Jainang, uh, which is a not, not quite as full and not quite as demanding. So uh, the, the main thing I think to approach it with is sincerity uh, rather than the idea of commitment or burden or I have to do this or I should do that or I should have done this, uh, but with a, a, a sincere and kind of a open-minded humility if possible, that's uh, uh, to approach it and see what it might have to offer you and take advantage of uh, the fact that there are people that uh, you can practice with, that you're not just sort of stuck out in the wilderness by yourself yet on a retreat, uh, that you have uh, su some support. Um, my, uh, my, one of my teachers, the great Yingma scholar, uh, Kempo Gyurme Trinley uh, used to say, he would not give empowerments. He would give the way he gave us the what would be called a jainang was that he would practice a, a sadhana with us, which gave us then we had permission then to practice that practice. And he would tell us that when we accomplish the practice, he will give us the empowerment. So that a lot that really removes in a lot of way removes that kind of burden because now you have the blessing of the practice, you have that open intention for the future of the practice. And you don't have to necessarily be ready to jump off of a cliff into the uh, ocean or to ride in a barrel down Niagara Falls or something. You can, you can come into it just with an open mind and with a sincere uh, uh, curiosity, really. Not curiosity in a light way. I don't mean curiosity like, oh, what's on TV today? Not that kind of curiosity, but a genuine curiosity that it's possible that this might be something that you would want to follow, uh, not that you have to follow it or that you should follow it, but that you might sincerely actually follow through with it. Um, when I was, you know, I've been practice, I've been practicing, my first and highest yoga empowerment was in 1993. And in the intervening time before I came to Sacramento, I was practiced with a lot of different groups. Uh, and one thing that I observed for a while is that people would uh, run around from empowerment to empowerment as they were as though they were going to plays or Broadway shows and compare notes. I've had this empowerment. Oh, you haven't had that one yet. Oh, you should get that one. You know, it's, so the main practice was empowerment. So I really uh, would suggest that you don't do that. <laughs> Um, I didn't see any benefit to that, and uh, it's sort of a cheapening of, of what we're doing to do that, I think. 
but uh, I also don't, uh, there, there are our points of view that say that if you're going to do this, you should be willing to go through with it and practice it right from the start, six times a day, and that you should never not practice it on any given day. And that's fine. If you want to do that, I say you should. But uh, if you aren't ready for that level, I don't think you should let those ideas stop you from attending the uh, J9 and entering into uh, an introduction to one of the highest practices that's uh, known in Vajrayana Buddhism. So anyway, that's my, my little two cents. Thanks, Dirk, and uh, to all my panelists, uh, Doug and Elizabeth here, and Marie and, and Dirk online. I I heard um, something that I thought was interesting, and certainly has struck me before. And I thought I'd just mention it, and then we can address a couple of questions that have come in, and then open it up to see if anybody here has questions. But um, I had taken one um, empowerment before Kala Chakra. It was Judy's Maja, and it was one of the situations that Doug mentioned where, oh, I heard people were going. And so I asked Lama if I should go. And he said, well, why not? Um, and it was totally overwhelming. And it wasn't until I sat down with some practitioners, it's especially some that had done it a lot, a fellow by the name of Michael Deneau, who used to practice here. And I just like got goosebumps when he was going through the sadhana. You know, I had a totally different experience with it. And then Kala Chakra came along and I thought, well, why, why do I need another one of these? Um, but one thing that I do like about Kala Chakra, and His Holiness has given it so many times to so many large audiences, and it's been available a lot around, but there are just a lot of practitioners, and it makes such a difference. You know, we've had kind of consistent practice here going at, at, at Lion's Roar, which is nice. They always have a friend that you can call and say, hey, you want to get together and do Kala Chakra. I've done Kala Chakra with Karen Burrow probably a dozen times in the woods, you know. We've met out here on the picnic table, some of us have met in here, and now we're online with, with the world being so networked together. And now, because of the pandemic, as Marie said, we're finding people from all over the world, like my, our good friend Serge is here, that we practice with, and I feel like, like he's my brother or something, and I've never met him, he's in Europe, but we're buddies now, you know? And it's just one of those things that once you practice it, you have friends, all, everywhere you know you can find practitioners everywhere and, and that, that sense of support is really big and I think that's kind of unique with Kala Chakra because of his holiness's commitment to offer it to so many people in the orientation of it so that's one thing I heard in, in the panel speaking so anyway a couple questions um, I'll, I'll put out kind of a, a light question and then we have one submitted that's a little bit more intense perhaps but I heard and maybe I'll start with Doug Doug, I heard you say that you try to practice this like three times a day since you learned to do that. And I would think three times a day, let's see, 10 years, three times a day, 300 days a year. Like, doesn't it get boring after a while um, with, with doing something like that every day for the rest of your life? So I'll start with Doug and maybe others can chime in as well. Well, that's because I do the short practice. That doesn't get too boring because it's only takes 10 minutes. I'm doing this well. I don't do it, so I can't answer that. Do you want to answer? Close it. And I'm hoping Marie will chime in too. So okay. You can always tap the top too. Sometimes that just like a nice. Um, I suppose if you were just doing the practice over and over again without any visual enhancements or understanding what you're actually saying, it might get boring. But oh, you know, I'm always practicing something within the college chakra practice, like the mudras. I don't know the mudras very well, so I've been practicing the mudras. That's always interesting to see if I can get a flow or in the process of enhancing the visualization part of the 
practice than sometimes when you have a large number of deities. It takes a little bit to hold them all still. So I spent a lot of time gathering people together, standing them up, making sure they're the right color. Um, <laughs> so it's gonna, I guess it sounds like I'm compulsively whatever, but you know, putting the visual stuff in is always interesting. And then there's always something going on. You'll find an object that shouldn't be there. And so then you engage in complete examination of where the hell that came from and apply the Abhidharma. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Anyway, that's my answer. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll hop in. I'll hop in. Sort of a, a I'll lead in to see if I could elicit comments about the kind of the layered quality to the Kala Chakra practice. You know, you can start out just doing something very simple, but it's got a bit of depth, and it's one of the things I appreciate about it. And I wondered if Maria or Dirk wanted to comment on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and 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 Kala Chakra is is it's it's it is it's really vast. That's actually in the notes that I made uh, for this morning. Is uh, I wrote Kala Chakra is vast. And um, you can really dive in as, as deeply as you want, as deeply as you feel capable of. Um, you can become as elaborate with visualizations as you want to because the, the system is so very elaborate. The mandala, the different deities that inhabit it. Uh, there are layers and layers of detail and meaning. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You can dive as deep into Kala Chakra as you want. I, I would say though that um, you don't have to. Also like Dirk was saying, don't feel like you have to take on more than you're capable of right now. And do be aware again, it's a journey. So you know, I thought the question about boredom was interesting. Lama always says that boredom is a form of aggression. So I always thought that was an interesting choice of words, but there are gonna be days when maybe you're not gonna to wanna to be on the cushion. It's, it's like with shamatha. Some days are easier, some days are harder. You might find you have kind of a honeymoon period with it, right? Where you're like super into it and then you might get tired and that's okay. All of that is okay because things change over time and you have to be willing to go with it. So, you know, in addition to being, you know, and so you just really like Lama says with Shamatha and, and, a, and a strong foundation in Shamatha is really critical to a stable Kala Chakra practice. So you're not getting out of doing Shamatha, you still have to do Shamatha. And that's really the key to, you know, having a really stable Kala Chakra practice. So where you have the skill to be able to check for things like boredom or excitement and see where your mind is and where your center is. So I think that's, that's really important. Thanks, Dirk, did you wanna add anything on that question? Uh, well, uh, I could say, I suppose that it's, that the text we practice is a sadhana and that sadhana is very rich and deep and could take you 10 years to completely master, but you, we mustn't confuse the sadhana with the tantra. The sadhana, there are many sadhanas, so there are many other sadhanas as well that approach it uh, somewhat differently or, or from different angles, from different purposes. And then we don't even want to confuse uh, Kala Chakra with the text of the Tantra itself. So Kala Chakra goes beyond any verbal expression that we might encounter. So I, by the time you get to a level where you're practicing beyond any possible verbal expression of Kala Chakra, it's pretty well guaranteed that you will not be bored. That's not the way it's, I guess. Thanks, Dirk. I, it's not that I take you for somebody that's bored with nearly anything you do. So um, we got we got another question, um, and maybe I'll just do a lean into this. One of the things I like about the Kala Chakra Sadhana is it's sort of a 
cheater practice for me because it has refuge in it and it has seven line prayer in it and it has a little emptiness meditation in it. So I can just do that one sadhana and cover all those other things that I said I would do in other venues. So it's kind of nice like that. Um, the question we got, which was from Matt in Australia. Now don't ask me how Matt in Australia found the, the opportunity to ask a question, but I appreciate that he did. And he said he'd probably be watching this tomorrow or whenever it's posted, because he's probably not watching now, but he asked about this overlap and I'll paraphrase a little bit, but essentially he asked, you know, how do you combine other things you do like lojong practice, for example, what's the relationship between lojong practice, which you're giving and receiving with the Kala Chakra practice that's a little bit more about maybe emptiness or pure view. So there's always this question like, how do I fit this in with all the other things I like to do? So I thought maybe I'd, I'd pose that as a question for our panel as well. And maybe I'll start in reverse order this time and see, Dirk, would you be willing to offer your opinion or observation about that? Well, Ellen did give me this, give us this question before. So I've thought about it. And of course, I don't know the answer, but I've, I have opinion about, about everything. So I would uh, check my opinion with someone else. <laughs> but my opinion, <laughs> Uh, is that at, that Lojong and Kala Chakra are a little bit like driving a car or flying an airplane. Uh, the, the, uh, in terms of your intention and your approach, you're either doing one or the other. Uh, Kala Chakra, though, in my opinion, includes Lojong, but it's, it, it's included, Lojong is included in a, in a way that's not explicitly uh, forward, placed forward. So we're talking about emphases. Lojong is an emphasis of a particular approach. And what the, we have to always be careful. I, I always have to be careful, maybe you don't, but I always have to be careful about confusing a technique, about confusing uh, verbal expression with the actuality and the reality. So uh, we're, what what the reality what the what the ultimate expression of Lojong is is not separable from what the ultimate expression of Kala Chakra is. If you if you are able to completely inhabit the world of Kala Chakra, Lojong is automatically included in that. Is what my opinion is. Okay, thanks, Dirk. Marie, do you want to add anything? No, what can I? Well. Like Dirk, I, I really don't have an answer. That, that question felt like it was way above my pay grade. But um, I think my, you know, in thinking about it uh, over the last couple of days, um, I actually had a kind of a practical thought, um, kind of like counterbalances Dirk's uh, much more intellectual one, which is um, when I think of the Lojong practice, I really think of Tong Wen. Um, and I have found for me as a Kala Chakra practitioner that Tong Wen is extremely useful um, as part of you know, the daily practice that Kala Chakra goes along with uh, to incorporate Tong Wen as a way um, you know, to really center the correct motivation, the cultivation of bodhicitta, cultivation of the correct view and then that transformational uh, view of our relationship with others. So um, I really feel like Tong Wen could be part of that, but it, like Dirk said, it, that, that all of that is folded in to the Kala Chakra, to the vastness of the Kala Chakra Tantra. So it's, it's also included in there, just not expressed in so many words. Thank you, Marie. Either of you want to turn your hand in that one? Okay. Um, so the, those were the questions that I had prepared before today, but certainly um, now is a good time we can open it up and you can just raise your hand or unmute yourself or raise your hand in the room physically, or you can put a question in the chat if you wanted to. So we'd love to have some more dialogue or questions.
Ellen? Oh, good. We exhausted everything. No, I've, I've got I've got a, a a question, I guess, or a comment. Um, you know, I mean, Lama teaches all the time about the Shambhala journey, about the journey for an enlightened society. And I have the empowerment and the Zhenong both um, from 2011 and practiced Kala Chakra, you know, pretty intensely for a few years. And then it just kind of fell off. Um, and other practices became more, more a set or part of my life. But I'm, I'm wondering if um, the Kala Chakra, because of its presentation as, um, you know, a, a vehicle towards world peace, and because of its really huge, huge, vast nature, um, is can be seen in some respects as kind of a uh, uh, foundation for everything else. That it is so encompassing, or do you see it as so encompassing that not only does it really, it just sort of underpins the other practices um, as well as incorporate them. It's because it is a journey, because it is the journey towards an enlightened society, towards an enlightened mind, an enlightened way of living, that it is, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking that, that it feels like it's kind of a foundation. It feels like it's, um, not a standalone by any stretch, um, that it, it, it's, it's sort of the floor of everything else. So just, that was just a comment and I'm wondering other thoughts on that. Anybody wanna agree or respond? I feel very much the same way, Susan. I feel like, you know, the few other empowerments I have kind of support my Kala Chakra practice and that Kala Chakra really does kind of incorporate all of those other deities. You know, it's a father and mother Tantra. So it kind of, yeah, it has it all. So foundational is a really good way of um, putting it. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah I, I would agree as well. What I found about the Kala Chakra sadhana is when I don't I don't feel connected to any part of it because I don't really understand it. And especially hearing the commentaries from Andy Weistrich to Jung Man Leeds this past year, every other ounce of Buddhism I've ever learned is built into Kala Chakra somehow. So the more I understand what, you know, it's again the sadhanas are short in a way and they're kind of cryptic and you don't necessarily know what they're doing and when somebody explains oh it represents all this and then it brings in the abhidharma or it brings in the mahamudra or shamatha and and so i think i don't know if it's foundational you know which came first chicken and egg kind of thing but that de definitely for me it's integrating so i would agree with you yeah thank you i think it's interesting that you put it that way because uh, for instance the the guru rinpoche empowerment my first empowerment that's explicitly presented as a foundation uh, and i think that all of the highest yoga tantras basically are uh, simultaneously foundation and highest goal because the ground itself is the goal right it's in a way so i think that i thought that was a, a really perceptive susan to say that And just from you know my personal limited point of view, Kala Chakra is almost too much for me to practice. I practice um, um, probably um, what is it? Dirt Kiriya is at the the level of Medicine Buddha and 
of the you know Shen Rezig and oh, you mean uh, Kriya Yoga action Kriya. Yeah, yeah yeah so I you know I practice really much more at that level than at the highest yoga tantra level um, because I think um, that's where I'm at I don't I don't 